We're gonna play a little rock and roll right now. Just let me hear some of that rock and roll. Rock and roll. Rock and roll, man. Rock and roll music. Rock and roll. Podcast with your host, Don DiMuccio. All right. Welcome back to the It's Only Rock and Roll Podcast. This week, it's part two of our conversation with the drummer for Free and Bad Company, Simon Kirk. Now, if you missed last week, go check out episode 23, where Simon discusses his time with the legendary band Free. But today, it's all about another legendary band of Simon Kirk's. A British supergroup who scored four certified multi-platinum albums, had about as much radio airplay as allowed by law, with singles like Can't Get Enough, Feel Like Making Love, Shooting Star, Rock and Roll Fantasy, and the list goes on and on and on. So sit back and enjoy part two of my conversation with drummer for Bad Company, Simon Kirk. All right, so what was the genesis of getting two guys from Free, someone from King Crimson, and Mott the Hoople's <laughs> guitarist together? What was yeah. that first time you got in a room together and said, let's do this? Oh, it was it was amazing. It started with Paul Rogers and Mick Ralphs. And Paul was in his band, his solo band called Peace, and they were opening for Mott the Hoople in what would be Mott's uh, final tour because Mick Ralphs was fed up with Ian Hunter. Mm. He wanted to leave, but he had to honour the tour. And every now and again, Paul and Mick would meet backstage. You know, because we were both on Island Records, Free and Mott the Hoople, there was a common ground there. And Paul and Mick started jamming together in the dressing room. And they fostered this uh, friendship over the, the days and weeks that they were on tour. And Paul said, you know, I, I, I really like playing with you in so many words. Would you ever think of forming a band with me? And of course, Mick was, yeah, I mean, I'd love to. They, they became such good friends. And Mick was kind of the opposite of Paul. And, you know, they say opposites attract. Mm. You know, Paul was this sort of serious, almost like a loner in a way, uh, not as gregarious as Mick. And Mick was fun-loving and very funny. I loved Mick. And to this day, I still love him. So anyway, they bonded. And when the, the tour broke up, when it finished, they went their separate ways with this idea to form a band. I was in Brazil. Uh, I went out there. I had a girlfriend out there in Rio and I lived there for a, a few months. And when I came back in early, I'm trying to get the dates right, very early 74, I called Paul. You know, we'd always gotten on well together and uh, in free. And, and uh, he said, oh, you know, I'm thinking of getting a band together with Mick. Would you like to be on drums? I said, I'd love to really would love to so we got together me mick and paul at paul's house little cottage just outside london in surrey and we jammed and i took to mick straight away not only was he a very good player but he was just so easy going and compared with the trials and tribulations that we'd gone through with costs right. only a year before you know this was a, a breath of fresh air sure well, he played this song. <laughs> he played this song to Paul in the dressing room, a sort of reel-to-reel -reel tape of a song called Can't Get Enough. It was with a drum machine, an open tuning, mm. and that famous sound. Mm -hmm. And he said, Ian doesn't want to do this song. I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Ian doesn't want to do this song. And wow. Paul heard it straight away and said, yeah. listen, mate, this is a fucking hit. Yeah. This is this is great. So that was, I think, one of the first songs we played together uh, was Can't Get Enough. Now, we didn't have a bass player. And so the search was on for a bass player. And that deserves its own place in history because we were desperate to get going. Now, here's the ironic thing, Don. We'd come from a band called Free. Mick was in Mott the Hoople. And I never enjoyed... The first couple of years of Bad Company were the most joyful for mm. me. Uh, in a way, we, we had been set free from our former bands. But anyway, back to the search for the bass player. We knew several people. We put a list together, and there were 16 bass players on that list. And the very last one was Boz, Boz Burrell. He was only last because we didn't like King Crimson. They weren't our cup of tea at all. They yeah. were progressive rock, yeah. jazz rock. We wanted someone who could, you know, was more bluesy, more rocking. So we went down the list, and we had, you know, several people tried out. Would we Roger know any Hodgson. of those names? Uh, Roger Hodgson oh. uh, auditioned. He didn't make the grade and went on to become a millionaire with Supertramp. <laughs> right. So we did him a favor. 
Bob Daisley, who went on to play with Uriah Heep. Oh. He was he was pretty good actually. And several, you know, we didn't, you know, they, they didn't make the grade. Yeah. Uh, and the last one was Boz. And I was intrigued because, you know, I, I never heard of him. But anyone who played with King Crimson had to be good. So we thought, you know, we'll give him a shot. So we arranged to meet him at this uh, rehearsal place in the King's Road in London. And he came down. He was great. He was a great looking guy, full of confidence, very well dressed. I mean, dressed stylishly. But when he walked in, we said, hey, Boz, nice to meet you, la, la, la. He said, well, it's nice to meet you. Before we start, let's go to the pub. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Uh, the pub was literally next door. Mm. I think he was a little nervous, yeah. quite honestly. So we went and had a quick drink and, and got to know each other a little. And he said he'd only been in King Crimson a few months, and he'd never played bass before King Crimson. And we went, what? Yes, I said, how long have you been playing bass? He said, oh, about six months. And we thought, wow. Yeah. Well, to be in one of the top bands in England, having only played for a few months, he must be good. So anyway, we, we went down and we started playing. And Mick said to Boz, I'll give you the chords of the new first song we're going to do. He said, no, no, don't bother. I'll pick it up as we go along. And I thought, hello. All right. <laughs> Very confident. Yeah. And he was great. I mean, he fitted in. There was a lot of laughter, very easygoing. And at the end of the day, you know, he went home and we put our heads together. Me being me, I always rush into things. I said, I think he's great. And Paul said, well, let me, you know, let's think on it. Mm. Yeah, I like him, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then the next day uh, we phoned, he phoned everyone and said, I like this guy. So we had a bass player. And I had heard in an interview he did that that really wasn't his scene that whole jazz thing and well yeah i that you remember that film the commitments yeah where the sax player starts putting in all these john coltrane phrases yeah. and well that was boz and it didn't become apparent until several years later but he was an into r&b and r&b straddles both the jazz world and the blues world right you know it's kind of and after a couple of years he started getting very busy busy playing and you know I, I realize now with the benefit of hindsight that he was just learning the bass when he joined us and I think as he got to the next level another level would open up and another level and he started veering away from the band you know he became this very busy jazz oriented bass player and it was a shame because I liked him very much but it did open up a rift primarily between Paul and Boz you guys hit the managerial jackpot mm. in Peter Grant. Mm. Paint the picture of exactly what that entailed because <laughs> it certainly wasn't just any old manager. No, I still have a lot of affection for Peter, even though he did screw us out of a lot of money. It, it came to light a couple of years after he passed away. You know, he, we, we were dumb, we, we trusted him. Yeah. But there was a little bit of shenanigans that went on. It's but, almost par for the course, though. Well, yeah, he did it to everyone. Uh, you know, bands were a lot less sophisticated and savvy back in those days. We liked him. And i tell you how it happened. Uh, our roadie with Free was a New Zealander. And he knew another New Zealander called Clive Coulson, who worked on Led Zeppelin's road crew. And Graham White, who was our roadie in free, told Clive that uh, Paul was looking for a manager for his new band. And, of yeah. course, Zeppelin were ruling the roost in those days. And Paul got hold of Peter's number and called him up and said, you know, we've got a band. And, and Peter was very interested and said, yeah, I'll come and see you. And he did a very clever thing. We were rehearsing in this little village hall. Now, this was before Boz had joined us. We were working with a sort of temporary bass player. But, you know, me and Mick and, and Paul had, had the songs down. Yeah. So we gave him the address of this little village hall, which is quite a long way from where he lived, across southern England. And he said, oh, I'll be there in a couple of hours. Now, this is in the days before cell phones. So we're playing along. We're playing the eight songs that we know, having a little break, looking out the window. No Peter. Play the set again. Look out the window. No Peter. <sighs> so about, I guess, four or five in the afternoon, Peter walks in and we go, oh, great. We put our instruments down, get down off the stage and go to meet him, have a little chat. Oh, it's sorry I'm late, boys, la, la, la. Um, so we said, we'll play the songs for you. He said, no, no, 
There's no need. What? <laughs> I've been sitting out in the car park with the window down. I've been listening to you. Oh. I figured I, if I'm the only bloke sitting in the seats, you know, in this little village hall, you're going to be a bit nervous. And he was right. He's smart, yeah. He's smart. And he said, I love what I heard. By the way, Led Zeppelin are putting together their own record label and we'd like you to be on it. Whoa, fucking hell. <laughs> Talk about hitting the jackpot. Yeah. And then he said a great thing to me. He says, oh, Sire, si, I'll help you carry your cymbals. Because I had one snare drum under my arm. We were breaking the gear down. Yeah. Let me let me carry the cymbals for you out to the, the truck. Oh, wow. So, you know, that was the beginning of, of a, a very good relationship, which lasted for several years until it all went south about six years later. Well, when you signed to Swan Song, was that, I mean, were you signed to Atlantic? How did yeah. that Atlantic were the distributors of Swan Song's uh, records. And Peter cut a deal with Chris Blackwell because he still had me and Paul under contract. And Island Records distributed Bad Company in England and Europe Okay. for, uh, I don't, for a couple of years. Yeah. Swan Song had us for America and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how that worked. But we were distributed through uh, Atlantic Records, yes. Okay. Now, that first self-titled album, my God, that's a classic. And mm -hmm. recorded in, what, 10 days at Headley Grange? Oh, not even, yeah. I mean, the actual recording was less than a week. Okay. Uh, and we mixed it, yeah, 10 days. We mixed it in three days. Headley Grange was the site of, you know, Zeppelin's greatest albums. Right. And we got the call to go down there. And I found out the real story, which is probably common knowledge now anyway. But... Uh, Paul got a call from Peter, said, are you ready to record? And Paul said, fuck yeah, we've been playing these same songs now for months. We're dying to go and record. He said, well, John Paul Jones has got the flu and yeah. Zeppelin have had to vacate Hadley Grange while he gets better. The real story was, by the way, mm -hmm. John Paul was fed up with all the carousing that Bonzo was doing on the road and off the road. And he was just fed up with the band and he wanted to leave and become the choir master of uh, Winchester Cathedral or Salisbury Cathedral. Talk about uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah, he wanted to leave and Jeez. he did leave for a very short while. So while that was all going on, while Peter was trying to placate John Paul Jones, yeah. Hedy Grange was going, you know, just sitting there doing nothing. We still had to pay. I believe the album cost us $1,500 to make. Mm. But we, we went down there so quickly. And all the gear, all Zeppelin's gear was still there. You know, Bonzo's kit was in the, the foyer. You just you got know, my next question. Yeah. As a drummer, I got to know, did you oh. use that same famous hallway? No. I didn't. You didn't. didn't? No, well, we couldn't touch the kit. Oh, right, right. right. And I didn't want to anyway. And it was actually a little too boomy for me. Yeah. Uh, I went down in the uh, the basement. The drums were sit put down in the basement. And I didn't want to touch Bonzo's kit anyway. No, it no. would have been uh, sacrilege, you know. What were you using back then? Uh, 22? Or, well, no, 22? 20, 26 inch. You were using a 26. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bonzo arranged it for me. Uh, he said, you got to get a... You know, he'd seen the drums I was using with Free. He said, oh, you know, they're puny. Get something with a bit of meat uh, behind them. Yeah. And uh, use what I'm using, 26 by 14. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the rat tom was about the same size as my floor tom. Uh, <laughs> sure. And then 16 by 16 and 18 by 20. Uh, no, 16 by 18 floor. So 16, 16, 16, 18 floors, 14 by 10 rack regular snare and a 26 by 14 bass drum. That's what I use. He was using pace cymbals. What did you use? I've always used pace cymbals. Okay. Used them for over 50 years. I like the sound of them on other people's records. My own. Yeah. I always like the old Zildjian A's. Zildjian, yeah. Yeah, I, I never really played uh, Avidis. Um, but, you know, honestly, Don, you could blindfold me. I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, I know. That's just me. What I liked about playing at Hedley Grange was the separation. And because we had been playing these 8 or 10 or 12 songs over and over, we knew them backwards, forwards, inside out, whatever you want to call it. So we could afford to be spread throughout the house. And that's how we got such a good sound, because everything was isolated. Right. 
we used Ronnie Lane's mobile studio and we set up house and we were there for a week or 10 days or whatever it was. We could get up whenever we want or whenever was conducive for us. There was no problem with neighbours. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a lovely time to record and Paul did the vocals to Bad Company out on the lawn at about one in the morning wow. and... Uh, we had a cook preparing our meals. Uh, it was just a great time had by all. I loved sure. it. Now, you mentioned John Paul Jones was kind of fed up with John Bonham. Didn't John Bonham call you guys to a meeting one day? <laughs> yeah. It was when we were launching, or when Zeppelin were launching Swan Song Records. We had two launches, one in New York City, one in L.A., and we all were flown out to New York, and we were staying at some plush hotel. And I got a call from um, Richard Cole, who was Zeppelin's tour manager. Manager, yep. And he said, Bonzo wants a meeting with all of you. He, no, he went to each one of us. That's it. He went to each one of us. And I got a sort of pounding on the door about an hour later. Kirky, <laughs> open up. And, of course, John walked in. He was done up to the nines. He had a lovely suit because we were about to have the, the lunch uh, about an hour later down in the uh, in the dining hall. And he said, listen, I, I know you like a drink or three. This, this swan song thing is really close to all of our hearts. And, you know, I want you to behave yourself. <laughs> Words to that effect. You yeah, know, talk yeah. about the pot calling the kettle black. I know. Um, and I gave him my word of, you know, that I would, you know. And, and it was true. I mean, this was a big deal for Bad Company. Uh, to be on the label with the biggest band in the world uh, who would become like big brothers to us. We weren't going to screw it up. And we, you know, we we did behave ourselves and it it went off very, very smoothly. How much support did you guys get from the members of Led Zeppelin when needed? Did you feel like you could reach out to them? Sure. Yeah, Yeah, they they had a, you know, an incredible vested interest in this. Mm. And um, they had heard the acetate of the first album and they knew we were a good looking band. We were all in our mid 20s. We have probably one of the one of the greatest singers ever. We knitted together well, and we produced an amazing album. So they weren't about to ditch us. Mm-hmm. Um, they ruled the roost. They were really an amazing band. I know that's one of these duh moments, mm-hmm. but Zeppelin really were an amazing band. Oh, God, yeah. and, 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 and they were nice guys. Uh, Bonzo I had to tread carefully with because I now know with my dealing with drink and drugs that he was an addict. I mean, he really was. Him and Jimmy were really, they they really tied it on now and again. And um, if it wasn't for their youth and their supernatural musical ability, they wouldn't have gotten where they did get on, you know. I mean, Bonzo could stay up all night, drink all night, and with a line of Coke or a couple of amphetamines, play yeah. like a god the next day. Right. You know. Right. So anyway, I, I digress. We never actually reached out to them for advice or solace or whatever you want to call it, but we knew that they had our backs and they came to our, some of our shows. Obviously, we went to some of their shows on the road. What yeah, was the first on. tour that you guys did? Did you go out as headliners? No, no. We uh, we went out with oh, several people. We always opened the show. Okay. Edgar Winter's White Trash. Mm-hmm. That was the main band that According we... According to Wikipedia, Edgar Winter's White Trash... Oh, was I do that all the time. Album by oh, Edgar my Winter God. His first with his group White Trash. Let me uh, unhook The that. album reached number 111 on the Billboard charts and produced the single Keep Playing That Rock and Roll, which went to number six. Wow. I'm keeping that, that in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I got my show. Let him get his own show over there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, the tour was a great tour in that by the time we got to the final show in Boston, the album was number one. And, and as we had toured around, I think we were out there for about 10 or 12 weeks. Uh, we didn't have, you know, there were no cell phones back then. So we really didn't know the uh, progress that the album was making. But, you know, it was all good. And, and by the time we got to Boston, we played at the tea party. and Peter Grant was there, end of tour, big deal. We were in our dressing room. Our tour manager said, Peter wants to speak with you before you go out. He said, of course. So we went down to this room where Peter was, and he said, come on in, boys, close the door. And he made a little speech, and we all got a little tearful because he said, 
I never in my wildest dreams thought that this would go as well as it's gone. And I, we were saying, thank you, Peter. You know, you've been a great, such a support for us and et cetera, et cetera. And then someone turned down the lights in the auditorium to signal that we were about to go on. And the place mm. went nuts. And we could hear, you know, this roar. And Peter's still, he's still talking, you know, boys, you know, I've been in this business a long time. And then the people are going crazy. And we're saying, Peter, he says, wait, wait for the feet. And what? Wait for the feet. Now, before you go on, and he turned around, and on the table was a sheet, and he whipped back this sheet, and there were four gold albums of the first album. Yeah. These, This is for you, and, and we're all getting, like, choked up. Sure. And he said, and sure enough, we started hearing this, the people doing the feet, the feet you know, yeah. above us. Yeah. He says, now get the fuck out of here and give me a good show. And we went out there, and we played one of the best shows we ever played. Back then, there was album rock, you know, and there was AM singles, and the two didn't always meet. Led Zeppelin had only a handful of songs that charted. But you guys right. did. You had best of both worlds. You made songs. You didn't just release extended jams and self-indulgent mm. solos. Did you have a singles mindset? I look, I'm, I'm going to go back to, to what I said in the last interview. that We just played the songs, you know. We No, you're right. We were not interested in the seven or eight minute jams. That really wasn't our thing. Mm. And, you know, a lot of, you know, I mean, Stairway to Heaven is like, I don't know, nearly six minutes long. A lot of Zeppelin's three, three and a half hour show, they maybe played 10 songs. You know, they they could jam and they love playing and, and that's what they did. You know, Bonzo did 20 minute solos every night. That That's just what they were about. We weren't. Right. Um, we just loved songs. The power of the three, the three and a half minute song was not something that we aimed towards. That's just what we did. We, right. we Paul wrote very, very good songs. And uh, all right, we extended it a little bit. I believe Shooting Star on stage is, is about six or seven minutes. But... You know, it's still a song yeah. with with a very long <laughs> with and, a very long ending. And on stage is fine. I'm talking yeah, about these bands yeah, like Pink yeah. Floyd would have one whole album side of one yeah. song. Yeah, you had back in those days. You had this AOR. You had the Top Forty, right? And FM radio, which was coming into being in the mid to late sixties. FM kind of opened up this new genre uh, where they didn't play. Uh, the Arches, they didn't play the Carpenters, they right. played music yep. for music's sake. And, and it was it was kind of a lifeline for a lot of bands uh, that you could hear The Doors, The Grateful Dead, you could mm -hmm. hear Pink Floyd, you could mm -hmm. hear Zeppelin and Deep Purple. Mm -hmm. um, but we did know that to have a good single meant increased album sales. It was a, a shortcut to selling. So, yeah, I mean, we never really subscribed to singles, although Rock and Roll Fantasy was a, a big single for us. And that's fine. You said earlier that the first couple of years were very happy years mm. with Bad Company. What changed that? Well, it, it was the same malady that inflicted or afflicted free in that the record company just started taking liberties and they started booking us on these huge long tours with very little time off, expecting us to do an album every year. The workload, that's really what, what started it. And Paul, once again, said, you know, fucking hell, we've done three major tours. We've done uh, Bad Company, Straight Shooter, and run with the pack. Bam, bam, bam. They all went platinum. I'm not complaining. Right. But we needed some time off, and there just wasn't any time off. And when, by the time we came to do Burning Sky in 1976, we didn't have any material. We have, well, maybe two and a half songs. We really didn't have a lot. And we were supposed to deliver an album by such and such a date. So when we all convened uh, in France to do uh, the album, you know, it was like, Hey guys, how are you? La la la. <sighs> well, what do we do? So the rot had started to set in and um, I was doing a lot of blow. You know, we were all doing coke. We were all drinking mm. too much. Mm. We were still young, so we could, you know, we could shrug it off. Uh, but it did start to uh, affect our performances. And right. Paul, to his credit, stopped doing, uh, he stopped doing coke. Uh, 
in the early early 76 and never never touched it again but me mick and boz you know we still continue to do it we managed to put together a pretty decent album but it just didn't have the 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 punch right that the first three had had and we started getting bad reviews and i never forget the melody maker you know the big uh, music yeah. trade paper in england at the time said bad company a crack in the sky and i thought uh oh and uh see i can still remember the headline sure and it, we always yeah, remember the bad reviews yeah <laughs> i know yeah and it started to, you know, say, you know, that we were not as good as we were. And uh, then we were booked on yet another tour, mm -hmm. which started to get really, really bad. And um, of course, it was during that time that Kosov died. So we were in New Orleans, uh, March 19th, 1976, on yet another tour. And um, I got a call from Peter Grant. And... Um, you know, he said, I've got some bad news, Si. Oh, fuck. He said, Paul Kossoff just died. And I was really, really upset. Of course. And now we had a show that night. And he said, he said, I don't know what to do about tonight. Should we tell Paul or not? And, you know, the tickets have been sold, some 18,000 tickets. And I know that Paul would have been very affected by this. Sure. And it, it would... He would have. He might have even said about cancelling the show, which would have been unrealistic because you've only got four hours to to the stage time. So I said, "Don't tell him, don't tell him." So I went on stage knowing that Costa de was dead, and when it came to shooting star, you, I don't know how I got through the song, especially when the line "Johnny died one night, died in his bed." Uh, I mean, I just broke down and lowered my head and cried. And it was after the show that uh, Peter Grant told Paul, and Paul was quite angry that he hadn't been told. I can understand. Yeah, and and yeah, but we got through it. You know, 1980 was a horrible year. Bonzo passed away. John Lennon was shot. Yeah. Uh, with the death of Bonzo, Zeppelin broke up. Peter Grant went into seclusion, and Bad Company were really left high and dry. Peter wouldn't answer his phone. I actually went down to his house, a long three-hour drive, mm -hmm. to try and just talk to him and see what the fuck was going on. Uh, he wouldn't see me, and um, that was it. Paul said, I'm out of here. I can't work like this, yeah. and uh, he took off, and um, we would... The rest of the band were just left twiddling their thumbs. Zeppelin broke up, much to their credit. You mm. know, uh, they could have gotten another drummer, but it really... There's one band you cannot replace members in, and right. Zeppelin were, were the epitome of that band. Um, so we were just left twiddling our thumbs for a couple of years, and that's when we got Brian Howe in. Was there any acrimony between you and Paul? Did he just leave? No, I, I, not at the time. Yeah, he. We were all fed up with each other. There, there'd been a fist fight between Paul and Boz um, when we were making Rough Diamonds. Yep, that was terrible. Uh, we managed to get through and finish the album, but really the band was in tatters. We all went our separate ways. So, but the the, the acrimony did come back between me and Paul, you know, and Mick, uh, when we got Brian Howe in the band. And um, it never really dissipated until, you know, only a few years ago, I honestly believe. You can ask Paul. Part of me agrees with him. Part of me validates uh, what me and Mick and Boz decided to do. And that was to get another singer. It had been a couple of years. I had a call from Armand Ertigan, the head of Atlantic, saying, you know what, you, you've worked hard, you've got a great band. I was reluctant because I, I was close to Paul, uh, but there was a self-preservation streak in me that wanted to carry on. I didn't want to go back to square one with a new band and start all that, you know, right. that whole thing again. So we did. We auditioned singers and we got Brian Howe. And Bad Company went off on a different direction. And quite honestly, it's a decision that I do regret. Although we did sell a lot of albums, we were pretty successful. A lot of people and love it, it, yeah. I know. And when Brian passed away last year, mm. you know, I saw a lot of Facebook and uh, Twitter feeds 
And a lot of them are saying, you know, he was a great singer. I love that version of Bad Company. You got to remember, Don, that we've been around nearly 50 years now. Right. And there are generations who weren't aware of the original lineup, who right. came on board in the mid to late 90s when Brian sung with us. So, yes, there are two definite versions of Bad Company. And I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't been inducted in the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's like, how do you induct two bands it well is. they did it with fleetwood mac yeah and they were well, three different bands four different bands so yeah. I don't, you guys should be inducted for sure I, well i, I absolutely agree. from live in albuquerque 1976 that's bad company and i want to extend a huge thank you to simon kirk who graciously talked with me over a span of two days because the man really loves what he does and you can really sense that through it all ups and downs success loss He's nothing but proud of the body of work he's been responsible for, and he should be because both Free and Back Company are among the best in rock. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame needs to get their head out of their ass and stop putting in hip-hop artists and get Bad Company inducted yesterday. If you guys want to send me hate mail now, email me at itsonlyrockandrollpodcast at gmail.com. And remember, it's all one word, no spaces, and is spelled out A-N-D. The internet's pushing 30 years now, guys. Come on, get a clue. Thanks again for joining me on the It's Only Rock and Roll podcast. See you next time.